What a beautiful day. Welcome back to my kitchen. It feels like my birthday. Today, we're going to make poached egg over pan-fried potato with prosciutto cotto and hollandaise sauce. Poached egg over chorizo hash with a gravy of tequila and jalapeno. Tastes great. And we end with chocolate chip pancakes. Oh, mama mia. In this show, you will learn all there is to know about my love for American-style breakfast. Come for the recipes. Stay for the story. I just arrived to America. The next day, my friends took me out for breakfast. My English wasn't all that good. And when I saw the menu, I realized that I didn't know the name of any of the stuff that was on the menu. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> you know, in Sicily, for breakfast, you get out, uh, you toast some bread, uh, you put some fresh uh, butter on it, some jam that grandma made, and it tastes fantastic with a little bit uh, of a cup of cafe latte to go along with it. But it was not an American breakfast I witnessed. And the waitress, the waitresses, came with the breakfast, just my portion. I'm sure they wanted to impress me, my, my own. <laughs> it was a cornucopia of food. <laughs> and there were eggs in all different ways, poach, fry, scramble. There were omelets, uh, there were pancakes, uh, uh, there was French toast, uh, and gravies everywhere. I've never seen so many sauces for breakfast. And then there were sauces, hot sauces on the side. Mamma mia, I ate. I ate. <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't kill anybody with one of the buttons popping out of my pants. I was so full I could hardly walk. When it comes to my favorite dish for breakfast, Eggs Benedict is it. So I decided, why don't we make it Stellino style? But not only I had to learn how to actually make it, but also I had to invent a new different way on how to make hollandaise sauce. Let me show you how to make it. Poaching eggs is an art form. What we want to do is to keep the temperature in the water between 195 and 200. Now we're changing a couple of things here. What I've done in this particular situation, I placed no salt, no pepper into the water. As well, I did not place any vinegar. Vinegar is uh, an expedient facilitator to make sure that the white of the eggs, the albumin, goes around the yellow in a much more compound way. However, I found that it also makes <laughs> the eggs taste like vinegar. So in this case, I don't like to do that. But what I'm doing, as you can see here, is a new trick that was taught to me by some of my friends. Uh, they have big restaurants, and I was asking them, when you guys make uh, the breakfast in the morning, you crack the eggs one at a time. And they show me that when the temperature is right, the perfect simmering temperature, you can add the eggs in a large number, and then you just have to let them be. For four minutes, you want to leave them alone. At first, you will be tempted to be overtaken by panic, because what you will notice is the egg whites are floating all over the water, uh, almost as if it were a ghost. But at the end of the four minutes, you will notice that all of the egg whites, for each one of the individual eggs, will have covered the yellow of the eggs, the yolk of the egg, giving you the solid form. They're not completely cooked at four minutes, but they are strong enough for us to take them out with a slotted spoon, because it's a much softer edge and allows us to take up the eggs without breaking them. I'm gonna take them out one at a time, and as you can see, I'm placing them in this other bowl that also has some warm water. Why? What basically this is, is that gives us the ability to park the eggs. The eggs will not continue to cook, so they will not overcook. You're safe that way. This is one of the greatest tricks I've ever learned. The next thing I wanna show you is how to make my very own version of ham steaks, which I lays with butter and brown sugar. The reason why I came up with this recipe for ham steak was because every time I go to the store, I can never find a ham steak of the thickness that I like. So as you can see, what I've done, I have gone to the deli section and asked them to cut me a single slice, about the thickness of my finger. But we're not done yet. I like to cut it into smaller versions. I find that a steak like this has three good portions in there. <laughs> now, let me separate them so you can see them. Now, what I like to do is I like to brush them with some uh, softened butter. Why do we do this? What we want to do at this point is just to moisten it. And you know why? Because there's a little secret of what I'm about to do. This is a, a Nixtelino magic rub. Literally, it's so simple. You the recipe right now. 
one tablespoon of brown sugar, one tablespoon of salt, one tablespoon of pepper, one tablespoon of paprika, one tablespoon of onion powder, and one tablespoon of garlic powder. You wanna make sure that you shake it real well, and then once you brush the ham steaks with the butter, and it sticks on perfectly. And what I love about this is that all of these elements that are coming together brings out a crust of flavor on the outside of the steak that really enhances the flavor completely. And with you, really, you don't have to do that much to it. Well, the pan, the griddle is perfectly hot. Uh, we have this gorgeous ham steaks in front of us ready to go. Well, let me cook them for you. Place it right here. The temperature that you're gonna have on the grill right about this time is between 450 and 500 degrees. What you wanna do is at this point, just let them sit in there for about a minute and a half, two per side. And we don't want to cook the ham all the way through. The ham has already been cooked. All that you want to do is to put some nice grill marks. The steaks have the most beautiful marks. Sugar that's caramelized on top, bringing in all these fantastic flavors. These ham steaks are fantastic. Well, we're done with those. Now, let me show you how to make ham fried potatoes. The oil is nice and hot. So here we go. We have added all the potatoes to the pan, and this is the most important part. Don't touch them. We got them on medium high heat, let them be. It's very important for the potatoes to build a crust. Right now, don't do a thing. No salt, no pepper, just let them be. Be patient. Give them a couple of minutes until they're perfectly brown on one side. Now we just flipped the potatoes. Now you can see the beautiful browning that before was underneath. It's at this point that I like to add pepper and a little bit of salt and chives. The potatoes are now cooked perfectly. We got the perfect spicing. The only thing that I need to do is to add a little bit of butter and then toss the potatoes and move them around. The butter will give it a glaze. The butter is extremely important for the glaze indeed. And this is it, turn off the heat. The glaze is perfect. These potatoes are ready. And now, now I'm gonna show you to make the hollandaise sauce. Now we add the butter. But you want to make sure that as we add the batter to the pan, you keep it on medium low. Uh, why? Hold on just a moment. Let me add some chives. It's going to open up the flavor for the sauce. Uh, the reason why we do this is because I want to open up the butter with an extension to its own flavor. And I find that the chives is a wonderful way to put the, a little bit of the taste that I like that has that onion essence to it. Then the, there is the part that I love the most, my secret. Uh, this, as you know, has all the ingredients that I love, the brown sugar, the paprika, salt, pepper. Oh, mamma mia. You wanna whisk and make sure that all the ingredients are together. At this very moment, the most important part that's taking place is that all of the ingredients in the pan are opening up, they're blooming. You've heard this expression many times, especially with cooking Asian food. The blooming effect that this does is going to reverberate within the context of the hollandaise itself. And as I show you in just a moment how to actually handle the eggs, you will become masters in your own home. Last thing, a little bit of the lemon juice to the butter, and we're now ready to add the eggs. One thing you want to do first and foremost is to move the pan away from the heat, but still keep uh, the heat on low. And now, on the heat that's still retained by all the ingredients, to this, we add the eggs in a solid stream, and then whisk, whisk consistently. In spite of the fact that there is no heat underneath, you have to realize that if you stand still, you might actually turn these eggs into scrambled eggs, and then moving forward and backward between the heat, and the no heat, you want to ensure that you're thickening up the eggs to become a sauce. And you have to be very attentive when you do this. In other words, don't be do too much talking like I'm doing right now. Focus on the eggs. I can see at this point that if I leave it here a little bit longer, 
it would be too much. And this is what I do at this point. I move them away from the heat, keep whisking, whisking. Our hollandaise is perfect. It's ready, and now we're ready to plate. I like to place them on one corner all together. Remember, make a nice size of the potatoes because what you're going to do on top of these potatoes, we'll put our eggs, and on top of the eggs, we'll put the hollandaise sauce. The next thing, ah, a little piece of grilled ham just as it is. And I reheated the eggs in a little bit of hot water. Very gently and attentively put them in. You notice, look how soft still the yolks is. This is one of those techniques that you will love forever. And this is the part I love the most. Coating the eggs with the sauce. One last addition, a little bit of chives. And this is how you make Eggs Benedict, Stellino style. My wife was concerned when I showed up with four carton of eggs. <laughs> she said to me, it's only the two of us. I said, honey, today is the day I master the poached egg and that's it. Lucy, what do you mean, what do you mean? I says, it never comes out the way that I want it. It must have been, I was in almost 36 eggs into it that I finally discovered it. And my rule is, if I cannot do the same thing 10 times and have it come out exactly the way I want, the recipe doesn't work. <laughs> That's pretty much how I, I do everything in life. I put this thing in my head and I gotta go all the way through. Discovering chorizo was for me a very big deal. I only knew about Italian sausage. The fact that I wanted to incorporate chorizo into a potato hash was to extend this flavor that I just discovered. But I also am in love with sauces, and this tequila jalapeno sauce is unique. This will give a completely different feel to the breakfast that you will have every morning from here on. Come on, let me show you how to make it. The oil is nice and hot in the pan, and so the first ingredient we're gonna add is the mirepoix, and we're going to stir this. The mirepoix is a combination of celery, onion, and carrots. Uh, we, Italian, we call it soffritto. It's at the base of every soup and every sauce. And then we're gonna go with the bacon. What I like about the bacon is that in this fashion, it gives an enormous amount of flavor and it creates a base that's extremely important for us in the sauce. The bacon is in here. You'll notice that instead of flashing this on very high heat, I'm going very softly on medium heat. And that's exactly what you want to do. This is a long play. While this is cooking, I wanna add a couple of interesting additions. Here we go with tomato paste. Why? Uh, <laughs> I used to make demi-glace at home. Uh, demi-glace is a byproduct of veal stock uh, that is used in classical uh, French and Italian cuisine. And one of the things that I've learned is that when you use a tomato paste and you add the tomato paste to the roasting bones of the veal that you use to make the stock, ultimately, that you turn into a veal demi-glace, it gives it even more flavor. In a certain way, we're trying to do the same thing here, making sure that the tomato paste attaches itself, glazes itself to the sofrito and the bacon. Now here we are ready with the magic ingredient, some brown sugar. Why the brown sugar? The brown sugar is a little bit of the yin and yang. There's an enormous amount of saltiness that we have already present within the bacon and the tomato paste. As the molasses melts and the sugar goes into it, there is a deepening of flavor of the sauce. And now we're gonna be adding a roughly chopped jalapeno. You know how precise I am. I like to have everything perfectly cut, but in this particular case, at the end of the sauce, we'll be straining the sauce. So it truly doesn't matter how we cut it. But what we wanna make sure is that you take out the seeds. As this is cooking, it's time now for us to add a little bit of regular pepper with it, a little bit of regular salt, and just a little bit, enough to kind of get it going on. And now here comes the most important addition, tequila. Why tequila? This being a Latino-inspired, actually a Mexican-inspired sauce, I thought that the tequila was the proper match. What you want to do is to cook it until it reduces by half. The next thing we're going to do, we're going to add beef stock. To also give heft uh, to the sauce, we add a little bit of tomato sauce. Now, increase the heat a little bit, just for a moment, because you want to bring this to a boil, and you want to completely stir to make sure that nothing sticks to the bottom of the pan while you get the boiling temperature. Here we are at a boil, and it's at this point now that you want to reduce this to a simmer. 
and you want to let this simmer for the next 35, 40 minutes. And while this is cooking, I wanna take a moment to show you how to make my favorite recipe for potato hash that I make with chorizo. The oil is getting hot, we are cooking it on medium high, but to be sure before we add the potatoes, let's add one, just to see. Now, as you can see, the potato is starting to float around, supported by the bubbles underneath, and I will propose that when you make this recipe, you also use a non-stick pan. It will make it so much easier for you. So the potatoes, all we've done with these potatoes, we just cut them in small cubes. And the reason why we go with small cubes is because this way they cook a lot faster and let them be on this side on medium high heat for about three minutes until they form a crust. As the potatoes are cooking, I want to start piling up the flavor. So here we go, first and foremost, with our uh, thyme. Fresh thyme is fantastic. I like to sprinkle it on top of it. It brings out an enormous amount of flavors. And we have some red peppers that we dice very, very fine. Quarter inch dice, the perfect and some green peppers. Why? Red, green, if there was white peppers, it would be the perfect Italian flag. It is at this point that what I want to do is start to mix things up. And this is the reason why we're making this dish, chorizo. This is chorizo sausage that I have already browned, and I've also strained of the excess oil that was uh, rendered during the cooking process. Why is this important? Why is the chorizo important at this point? The chorizo is the true character of this dish. Time, remember that the chorizo itself is loaded with an enormous amount of flavor. As we're mixing it together here with our potatoes and with our peppers, we are creating the base for what will be the hash. Now, what is a hash? Hold on, before I tell you that, a little bit of salt, and a little bit of pepper. What is the difference between fried potato and a hash. Potato hash has a completely different character, not so much in the taste or the flavor of it itself, but it's in the way in which the potatoes are treated. Now, we cooked in a medium high heat on both sides and they crusted up pretty nicely. But what we're going to do now, we're going to add an ingredient that's going to open up the potatoes into a completely different new reel. Let me show you. Here we go, first with chives, because I want to continue to layer some of those flavors. the secret ingredient, broth, beef broth in this particular case because we're cooking with chorizo sausage. Why am I doing this? There you are. As you see the broth coming to a boil, let's reduce this down to medium. These particular potatoes go with everything. They are ideal, but the texture that is brought as they are starting now to almost, I could you say, braise uh, into the stock, as all the other ingredients are starting to exchange the flavors, this is the magic that brings out this unique flavoring of this potato hash. And we will continue cooking the potatoes until they're cooked all the way through and they're a little bit darker. These potatoes are ready. Let's keep them warm in the back of the stove because the next thing I wanna show you is how to complete and finish the jalapeno sauce. The sauce, she's absolutely beautiful. Now we have strained the sauce, we have degreased the sauce, and all we're doing right now is reduce it a little bit more to a thicker sauce consistency, and we're just about there. As a matter of fact, the last thing that I need to do is add a little bit of chives, just for color at this point. We've got plenty of flavor in there. Turn off the heat and on dollop of softened butter and stir it. What does the butter do? As the butter melts into the sauce, it brings out this sheen, this color, <laughs> this reflection, I would say. Butter also thickens up the sauce. Well, the sauce is ready, potatoes are ready. Well, let me show you how to plate this. We first start with the potatoes. What I like to do is to make a nice bed of them right here in the middle of the plate. Lots of flavors in there. I have my poached eggs, which I've reheated in some more water. And then the best part of it all, tequila and jalapeno. What a combination. Chives that enhance the flavor all the way through. I like to put a little bit right on top of the eggs. In this is how you make poached eggs over hashed potatoes with chorizo surrounded by a wonderful, 
tequila and jalapeno sauce. The pancakes. The pancakes were another adventure. Mamma mia. How do you cook a pancake? At first I thought you fried it in olive oil, so I put a lot of olive oil in the pan, then I put the pancake batter in there. <laughs> Mamma mia, que porqueria. It was horrible. It took me a while, but my pancakes, when I make them, and I make them just right, they're more than pancakes. They're life in a circular form that I ingest with a little bit of syrup on top. For the longest time, I thought the pancakes only came from a box. So it was a big, huge deal for me to make my own recipe for a scratch batter for pancakes. In this particular recipe, you will find two unique things. One, how I use the chocolate chips and I put them right in the middle of the pancake as it's cooking. But also, I will use the egg whites to give the pancakes a lift. Come on, let me show you how to make it. All right. Let me show you how to make this wonderful recipe. First, we start with the flour. We have sifted the flour already. We're adding it in here. To get it to the flour, we add a little bit of baking soda and baking powder. Together with that, we also add salt. Let's talk about these ingredients, why they're so important. Uh, both the baking soda and the baking powder act as leavening agents. It will give a little bit of a lift to our pancake mixture. The salt we're going to have as a contrast to the brown sugar that I'm going to add. Now, this is something that you want to be attentive. Brown sugar is loaded with molasses, which is one of the extra flavors that I love, especially in the context of this. So what I do before I add the wet ingredients, I like to break down the brown sugar, just like this. At this point, the next thing that I do, I put a little dip in the middle, the next thing we're adding is my favorite ingredient, the buttermilk. What I love about buttermilk is the fact that the buttermilk has a very strong presence of its own. It has a creaminess to it, a tartness to it, and a full fullness of flavor that combined with all of the other ingredients that we have really elevates the pancake to the next level. Together with the buttermilk, we add the egg yolks. Now, typically you could add two whole eggs in here already mixed but there is something that I like to do for this recipe of mine, so let's incorporate all this. Now, the butter is coming together and I'm adding the buttermilk a little bit at a time because I want to control the consistency of it. We're almost done. I'm going to move this away and I'm gonna start working on the egg whites. I'm using a copper ball in this case. Why copper? Copper has a fantastic quality and when it interacts with egg whites, it really gives them the body that I want. To enhance that even more, a little bit uh, of cream of tartare will make this even better. What does it mean? Watch what I do. What the cream of tartare does it gives to the egg whites the ability to connect together into almost meringue-like consistency for it. But why are we doing this? Why are we beating this egg whites into almost like a meringue-like consistency? Ah, let me stop for a moment. As we beat the egg whites with the whisk, we are filling the egg whites with air. To be able to control that even more, one of the things that we do, we add some additional sugar, but in this case, it has to be white refined sugar that we do use. Now we've emulsified the egg whites. As we will fold this into the butter, it will achieve for us two very important things. The most important part of it is adding air to the butter, lifting it, making it even thicker and wider. As it will rise and as it will bite into it, there will be this tenderness, this creaminess to it as you never experienced before. There are two ways of looking at when the pancake is ready to be turned over. One way is to time it and just give it a minute and a half or so, but that's almost uh, the way that you need not to look at. There is a visual cue instead, which is far more important. Come with me, let me show you. You see these bubbles right on the perimeter of the pancake? That is your signal. And now you're ready to turn them over. That was a perfect turn. Look how beautiful they are. The pancakes are ready. Let me show you how to plate them. As a little boy growing up in Sicily, all that I knew about America is what I saw in the Hollywood movies. The pancakes were photographed as shared around the table. And I remember asking my mom and dad, says, what are those things? And my mom would say, fritelle americane, American fritters, she would call them. 
came to America and I had pancakes for the first time, I met a whole new world that I didn't know existed. Breakfast is not as easy as it seems. I'm of the belief that as I become older, there is no point to do things good enough. There's something beautiful about doing it just right. And the perfect egg, the perfect poached egg, oh, mamma mia, that's something else. If I had a bad day, I eat them for dinner sometime. Hey, dinner for breakfast. Trust me on this one. It's something you should try. It will make you smile. Poached egg over pan fried potato with prosciutto cotto and hollandaise sauce. Mamma mia, I cannot hold myself. Poached eggs over chorizo hash with jalapeno and tequila gravy. And we end with chocolate chips pancakes. Chocolate chips pancakes. And we end with, uh, yeah, I put S's everywhere. <laughs>